Spotlight is proudly sponsored by HEC Media, St. Louis's home for arts, education, and culture. What's greater than people? I mean, what's more valuable than people? It's a really rich place culturally, and there's just so much to learn on every corner. People need to know about this because it's a great program, and it's rewarding. Today on Spotlight, a thrilling novel about World War II and inspired by the true history of spies. Plus, an artist who says an illness helped her become more creative with her work. And then showcasing two nationally recognized painters in one local gallery. But first, an internship that places women and minorities in promising bioscience companies. It's Sunday and you're watching the multiple Emmy Award winning Spotlight. Using chloroplast to transform things is just exciting. This is something that I never thought in a million years could actually happen. Mache Cody's exciting journey into bioscience began in college. St. Louis Community College in the biotech program. Leading to her internship at the St. Louis ag tech startup Plastomics. Plastomics technology is designed to deliver beneficial plant traits for insects and disease resistance into major crops like soybeans and corn. Plastomics says it's doing it in a new way with greater benefits by delivering traits into the chloroplasts of plant cells. And Cody is helping. I do a lot of subculturing. We use different media selections. I get to do different arrangements. Just acquiring new skills that I never ever thought that I would be able to acquire inquire in my life. <laughs> Intern Danielle Robinson also works alongside scientists in a lab. Danielle is helping St. Louis startup Biopharma Greens with a plant-based expression system for a particular protein. The protein is grown in lettuce for an efficient and affordable way to produce therapeutics, in this case, a vaccine. The very first thing I did, they, they didn't baby me. <laughs> They made me do DNA extraction and I'm like, whoa. So I just thought that for them to trust me and to, to, to think that, okay, I can do this and I've done it. Getting proteins from plants and planting plants for a vaccine is just mind boggling. I would never think in a million years that I would be able to do something like that. The internships are made possible through BioSTL's Catalyst Internship Program managed by Angie Taylor. We are able to pay our interns $15 an hour for up to 20 hours a week for 12 weeks. It's part of a partnership with the Danforth Plant Science Center, BioSDL, and T-Rex called the Center for Ag Tech and Applied Location Science and Technology, or Catalyst. A $1.5 million U.S. Economic Development Administration grant supports Catalyst initiatives for precision agriculture and geospatial technologies in St. Louis. Through the Catalyst Internship Program, BioSTL is seeking minority students. Researchers and talent that are in disenfranchised communities or of color or female. Because in the world of science, Taylor says women are also a minority. It's believed research and development in the life sciences would benefit from the perspectives of people from different backgrounds. Allow for research to have greater opportunities. And the interns get the chance to get real world experience. Learning science in the education arena is different from doing science in these labs. A lot of times people say if you build it, they will come, but sometimes you don't come because you don't feel invited to the table. So this allows for minorities that are in research and development to feel invited to the table. The companies benefit too. We're very early stage company. We don't have a lot of funds at the moment. And so being able to work with someone, uh, explain why we're doing what we're doing, and then have the help when we really need it. Our interns are being trained by senior scientists and learning the work that we have to do in order to further our research. It allows for them to feel that pressure of knowing this piece of equipment that you're working with costs millions of dollars or this piece of research you're working on is everything to this company. Taylor says having diverse, 
early career researchers are essential for continued advancement of research and development in St. Louis. She says the program offers life-changing experiences that could one day lead to big things. Everyone is kind of scared to go into biology and technology. You know, everyone thinks that, you know, you look at the Big Bang Theory and you think this is what it is all about. You can't start from the entry level. So, I mean, I really just wanted to really personally challenge myself. Now that I'm into this world, I get to see the different companies. I didn't even know the biotech program even existed. It's like a, a window of opportunity. It's, it's like a well-kept secret, and it shouldn't be a well-kept secret. People need to know about this because it's a great program, it is, and, it, and it's rewarding. You, it will lead you to a good job, a good career. Scan the QR code on your screen to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Prolific romance novelist Madeline Martin is finally following her own true passion. It took me like 37 books to get here, so you know, just keep your head and stay down and, <laughs> and be diligent about it. Working as a business analyst and churning out six to seven Harlequin romance novels a year was a head-spinning start to fulfilling her dream of being a writer, but gave her little time to do what she really loves, writing historical fiction. My running joke was kind of that I was a full-time mom, full-time business analyst, and full-time writer. Her days as an analyst became numbered during COVID, and the result was her first historical fiction novel, the New York Times bestseller, The Last Bookshop in London. Her newest novel is inspired by the true history of America's library spies of World War II. Martin takes us from Lisbon, Portugal to Lyon, France during the war as we follow the stories of two brave women who are willing to risk everything for the cause of freedom. I remember in the very beginning of my writing career, we had to write down what we wanted for our, you know, our, our dream to happen with our writing. And, um, and at that time, there was a really big competition called the Rita. And so I said, oh, I want to win the Rita. And somebody said, well, don't you want to hit the New York Times? And I was like, that'll never happen. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, it, it felt, again, it's just almost like being an author for my full-time job. It felt so completely unreachable that I didn't even, like, think that I could even write it down on a piece of paper and hope that that could someday happen. So it's incredible. And let's talk about that. Here you go from working with numbers yeah. and accounting and as a business professional to go into something, uh, you loved history, but did you have a passion for writing? And once you start writing, what's that process like, especially in the very beginning? When I actually first started writing, I, I brought my very first book that I'd written to a meeting of romance authors, and we traded manuscripts, and I realized um, I was not very good. And so I spent the next five years, I didn't actually try to get anything published, I just spent the next five years learning everything I possibly could on writing. Share with those who are wanting to read what this book is about. So this actually was inspired by the librarians who were enlisted by the American government to go to neutral countries to gather intel as far as clandestine newspapers, manuals, pamphlets, things like that to send back to America. So um, I thought it would be really interesting if she received a coded message that would sort of, you know, launch her on uh, an adventure. And so I have my other character who is Elaine and she works with the French Resistance actually working the printing presses that make those clandestine newspapers and she's the one who creates that coded message. So this is their story. Right. Tell us about all the details that you talk about. For instance, when they were talking about typing the codes on silk, which I'd never heard about, I thought that was so fascinating. And the way that they did it, I thought, how clever. Um, did you learn this on, the, on your travels? How did you find these things out? Um, actually, I found that out. That particular piece I found in a nonfiction book. I read dozens and dozens and dozens of nonfiction books when um, when I'm working uh, and doing my research. And you know, it's really interesting all the little details that will come out. And I have I have a little spiral notebook perpetually by my side that I'm constantly handwriting all of my details in. And um, and really just finding those little nuggets. I love to slip those into my books because I feel like those are the real everyday life sort of things that get lost. They kind of get sifted through the cracks when, you know, books are being published. And, um, and so that's just like the kind of thing that I love to really share. Martin researched this book during COVID and tells a funny story about traveling during that time. To hear that and more, watch the full interview at hcmedia.org. They are the best-selling authors and all of your favorite genres. For in-depth, one-on-one interviews, go to hecmedia.org. 
This story brought to you in partnership with Missouri Life. Frescoes are traditionally defined as paintings done rapidly in watercolor on wet plaster, typically walls and ceilings. But modern fresco artist Ali Cavanaugh has taken this style to places it's never been before with her engaging portraits. I would describe my work as figurative realism. I would describe myself as an expressionist. And I would say that my older work pre-2015 was very literal in its technique and application, and now the technique is a little more impressionistic, but it's still essentially figurative realism. Allie began her career as a professional artist, mostly working in oils, but when galleries weren't showing her paintings, she decided to branch out into watercolor. And then I had, at that time, I was painting for a show in Austin, Texas, and when I, I did like 15 oil paintings, but then when I took those paintings, I also thought, well, I'll frame up these little watercolor paintings just for fun, just put them in the show. So when I went to the show, everyone wanted to talk about the watercolors. Like, I just remember people kept pulling me over to the watercolors, and they're like, these are so amazing. And I'm just thinking, I wasn't even taking that seriously. Those were just like fun little doodles in a way. But something clicked in me and I thought, you know what, there is something in the watercolor that is happening that is sitting differently with people and that I need to explore that. And there was no turning back. Her oldest daughter became her primary model and her audience grew. But her success isn't due to the media she uses to paint her subjects. It's her ability to identify and capture a moment in time. I think it's because when I was two years old, I lost a lot of my hearing to spinal meningitis. And so I had to read lips and look at body language, you know. I kind of have to look at the whole person and just being that way, just to communicate, I think it really made me in tune. And what's greater than people? I mean, what's more valuable than people? It's like each person has a story and this mystery about them. and. It's just the subject that, uh, to me, is just the best. I love it. You know, start to finish a painting, uh, the first step would be the inspiration. It's the person that I see that I am like, wow, they, they would be an incredible person to paint. I'm with someone, we're just living life, whatever, and they just do something, you know, they, the light hits them. and. And it's like, I just feel it, you know, and I get grab my phone, quick shot, you know, just save it and then recreate that when I'm actually trying to gather my material to make the painting. You know, we set up a photo shoot and I try to recreate some of the things that I saw, you know, just kind of in the natural world. And, and all of my models are people that I know, they're in my life, they're friends, they're family, they're, you know, people in the community. And I, um, take the photos, hundreds and hundreds, just for one painting, and I just study them. I stare for a long time and really try to connect with the face and what kind of emotion, what composition is happening in the body. Sometimes there's not really the perfect photo to work from, but several photos together to get exactly what I want. And um, I draw it out first on the panel and then I start laying the colors in. I'm always challenging myself with colors, new colors, uh, trying a different type of blue or a different type of green just to see what the material does. And I am always trying, when I'm actually going back to get my reference for a painting, I try to get the person to go inside of their head. It's the mystery of life and existence and it's like this intangible thing that makes you want to know more and sparks curiosity and all that. So that's what it is. I'm just trying to get, I'm trying to paint them when they get into like this introverted sort of place. I love painting people and, I, and I've tried doing landscapes and they're not good, but other people, that's where they see the soul, you know, and they, they paint those things with that connection. So it's, you should definitely be painting what you feel connected to. 
To learn more or see more stories like this, head to MissouriLife.com. HEC Media. Recognized. Celebrated. Honored time and again for excellence in the industry. Find all of the award-winning content at HECmedia.org. There's joy in remote villages around the world. Talented artisans are celebrating. And for the first time in history, they are connecting directly to their global market, thanks to the ingenuity of the Blessing Basket Project. Thank you! The artisans are excited because there's wealth, there's peace, there's prosperity, there's a future, there's the end of illiteracy, there's dramatic changes in their life and in their village and in the way they're viewed by people from the outside. So the Blessing Basket Project has more than 80 products that we deal with and we have more than seven countries, more than 3,000 artisans and every single item that we sell has been handcrafted by an artisan somewhere in the world in a developing country. And they're works of art. Each one of them is a work of art. What the Blessing Basket Project Prosperity Wage Model proves is that you don't need a lot of money to transform a village to truly lift people permanently and sustainably out of poverty. When you take our two models and you apply them anywhere in the world, poverty ends and peace begins. Most of our parents around here, they are not employed. It's through these blessing baskets that they weave and they're able to cater for their children. And even the poverty level in this community has just reduced. The work matters. It matters a lot. It matters because you can see the results of the work that we're doing. You know that there are literally, literally hundreds and hundreds of young women in the Argagana that have an education that can never be taken away. Teachers and parents celebrate Women's History Month all March long with more videos like this at educate.today keyword women's history music from miss jubilee later on spotlight we're at Hauska gallery in the central west end we have two solo exhibitions happening right now on the main level is roscoe hall's caution increases and in the upper gallery is michael hoffman's nexus roscoe hall is a painter coming to us from birmingham alabama when you first walk into the gallery you will see quite a few large-scale paintings, as well as some smaller pieces as well. His work is heavily layered, a lot of texture. He uses a mixture of many different materials. Roscoe's work is mainly focusing on different characters. They are representations of stories from his background and also from cultural events that have happened in the last few years. So Caution Increases is a show that Roscoe put together describing some very heavy emotional situations, but he also wants the viewers to know that he is hopeful and he wanted to convey some of the things that helped him get through hard times or difficult periods of his life. He heavily relies on his faith and hope based in Rastafarianism as a way to help him to get through situations that seemed too difficult to handle. As you progress through the gallery and head upstairs, you will see very colorful works by Michael Hoffman. I use a variety of different kinds of oil paints, um, some translucent, some opaque, um, and I kind of mix them all together to create the effects that I want. With my paintings, I use lots of rigid linear forms like stripes and targets and then I mix that with organic elements that break it up and create this contrast, this depth between the two. I've been working with these themes, the geometrical imagery, the circles, the grids, the triangles, for a long time. When I was about three years old we lived in an apartment um, underneath Charles Mingus Jr. Jr., the son of the jazz musician. And I remember going into his apartment with my family as a little child, and he would make um, target paintings on a turntable on pieces of cardboard with little brushes and pens and pencils. When I started getting into painting, that was the first thing that came to me, and so I've been exploring that 
theme for a long time. And now I have a rig I've made with a bicycle wheel that I put the panels on and spin them and apply the paint. But it keeps evolving. Everything is getting more finesse. I'm getting more control of what I'm trying to put forth. So I created almost all of these pieces for this show. When I first started painting, Charlie Hauska gave me my first show. And he asked me to show again, and I was excited to do another show with Charlie. We at Hauska Gallery are thrilled to have these two amazing exhibitions by Michael Hoffman and Roscoe Hall. They will both be available to view here at the gallery through March 24th. And for more information, you can visit our website at hauskagallery.com. Yo, this Dip, the founder of 314 Day. Now you can show your love for 314 even more. We're celebrating 314 Day from March 10th through the 14th by shopping and eating at your favorite St. Louis places. So head over to stl.com slash 314 Day for all the happenings. My name is Shane Perpizel, and I'm the Chief Operating Officer of STJ Group Holdings here in St. Louis. We have two uh, international grocery stores, Global Foods Market in Kirkwood and United Provisions in the Dumar Loop as well as four restaurants. We're here at Chaoban, a Thai restaurant in the Grove. We have King and I on South Grand, Oishi Sushi in Creve Coeur, and Oishi Steakhouse in the Chesterfield Valley. When my parents first started the business, international restaurants and grocery stores were pretty uncommon. They came here for school and they ran out of money and they needed to find work. And so at the time, there was a large Vietnamese uh, refugee population coming over at the end of the Vietnam War and they saw an opportunity to feed people who are unmoored from their home. And, you know, starting with a small little corner store in South City to now two grocery stores. When we first opened King and I, the menu was actually half Chinese and half Thai. My parents were kind of nervous that if we went with an all Thai menu, people wouldn't know what it was. And so we would have kind of traditional Chinese American dishes. And my, my mom and dad would go around offering free samples of pot Thai to people because it was new to them. I think they should be really proud of what they've accomplished here in St. Louis. A lot of people, they know the King and I, they know Global Foods, and I think they've built those things and our other businesses into St. Louis landmarks. You know, a lot of the great restaurants here in St. Louis purchase their ingredients from Global Foods, and you know, whether it's your favorite Vietnamese restaurant or Indian restaurant, there's a good chance some of their ingredients came from us. It's one of the few places in St. Louis where you can hear eight, nine, ten different languages going on, people from five different continents asking each other, what do you make with that? How do you use that? It's not just for us a grocery store, but a community gathering place for, for both new Americans or Americans who've been here for a long time wanting to try something new. Recently, we had a large influx of Afghan refugees, and so we went out of our way to find the types of ingredients that they needed and brought that here. American food culture and food ways are so much more interesting now. People are curious about where food comes from and, and these new tastes and flavors. So it's, it's kind of catching up on the new trend and seeing what folks are interested in and then scouring literally the world to bring it here to St. Louis. What's great with our businesses is that we get to partner with so many organizations, the Vera Asian Foundation, the International Institute, Operation Food Search. Um, you just realize that there's so many people and so many great organizations doing great things here. I think it's great having the opportunity to make my own mark on the business, you know, opening Chaoban and Unite Provisions and putting a more contemporary spin on it. So King and I, you know, being the first Thai restaurant in St. Louis, we focused on uh, central Thai food, which what I think most St. Louisans are familiar with. But my parents are actually from the, the north and south of Thailand where their uh, particular cuisine isn't well represented here in St. Louis. And so Cha Ban is kind of a, a love letter to the way I grew up eating. I thought, you know, why not open a restaurant where I can come here, uh, enjoy the dishes that I love for myself and introduce St. Louisans to different Thai dishes that they may not be familiar with. The menu that's reflected here is more of a regional specialty from the south and northeast. As much as I love pot thai and curry, it's the food culture is much more than that. And I think it's representative of the new face of St. Louis. My dad was telling me when he immigrated, the Grove was mostly industrial. You know, there were factories and foundries. When he said, you want to open a restaurant here, he was kind of perplexed and then he came down and, and saw 
you know, what the neighborhood's become, folks making it their community. Um, it's now one of the most exciting and diverse neighborhoods in St. Louis, and I think for a concept like this, it fit perfectly with what we're trying to do, kind of push some boundaries and introduce something new to St. Louis. Folks just have to kind of go out and see what there is, because there's so much more than the art and Bush Stadium. It's a really rich place culturally, food-wise, and there's just so much to learn uh, on every corner. You can find the stories featured in today's show along with past episodes and more at hecmedia.org forward slash spotlight. Next week, a page turner about a Scotland Yard detective who untangles a crime. Plus, meet an animator who worked on everything from The Lion King to Mulan. Thanks for watching Spotlight. Join us next Sunday at 9.30 a.m. on KPLR 11.